Marisha here, and today I'm going to talk about my experiences with the NHS and a little bit about kind of the differences of costs for medical care in the UK versus the US. So my experience with the NHS began when I applied for my student visa because you have to, in addition to paying your visa fee, pay an NHS fee so that you are covered for the year that you're a student. And then again, now on my new visa, it's a two year visa, so I had to pay for two years worth of NHS coverage. Shortly after I moved here, maybe two or three months in, I got a letter from the NHS uh, saying that I should have a pap smear. And I couldn't tell you the last time I had a pap smear in the U.S. because I didn't really need one, um, even though it's recommended that women get them every, what is it, two years or something just to, to check for cervical cancer and stuff. I felt like oh, I'm healthy. I'm not having any issues. I don't want to pay the money to go to the doctor for that. And same thing with annual physical. Uh, I got another letter from the NHS a few months after that to have an annual physical. Same thing in the U.S. It was something that I did not do on a regular basis because I didn't want to pay the money. It was like, I know it's going to be a copay. And then so many times when I went to the doctor, I would then get a bill later on, like six months down the road for something that insurance didn't cover. And it was always just sort of this um, Byzantine entity of trying to figure out what exactly is my insurance going to cover and what exactly is it not. Uh, it was always a bit of an enigma. And I think a lot of Americans put off preventative care because they just, they don't want to pay the money for it. They, you know, it's, it's too much. And a lot of Americans are already faced with hard choices when it comes to paying for prescriptions or other, you know, medical needs that they have. But here it was really easy to just say like, yeah, sign me up for all of these things. Cause I've already paid for it. And I know there's not going to be any surprise bill afterwards. Like it's covered. So I really like that there is this kind of diligence of like preventative care. Um, and then I did have an experience where I went to the emergency room. Um, in addition to the emergency number 999, like which is our 911, right? They also have a medical number that's 111. And it's for people who it, it's not a medical emergency, right? You didn't like sever your hand and you're bleeding out or anything, but it's, you're experiencing something medical and you're not sure if it's bad enough to be an emergency or not. Right. You know, you probably shouldn't wait to like see your GP, but you don't know if it's worth getting an ambulance over. You can call this number or you can go online and answer some questions and then they'll advise you on what your next steps should be. So I had an experience where you know, like I was throwing up and I had extreme pains in my stomach, like that didn't go away even after the vomiting had stopped. And this was actually like the third day in a row that I'd had the vomiting. And it wasn't like, it was only at night. So it wasn't like a stomach bug. It was, I had never experienced anything like it before. And the pain was so great that I was like, I need to get this looked at like now. Um, so I went online and answered some questions and I did say that I had, that I had pain in my chest because the stomach pain was like my diaphragm. It was very high up, like right at the base of my sternum. And I thought, I, you know, I don't think it's a heart thing, but I also know that symptoms in women are a little bit nebulous compared to like the classic heart attack symptoms. So I was like, I'm not, I'm not messing around with how bad this pain is. I'm like, it's, and where it's located, like I'm not taking any chances. So I answered yes to that question. And I think for that reason, they told me to dial 999. So I called 999, answered their questions. And, um, I, made the mistake of being a Midwestern American and being very stoic and very, it's a very much a culture of just suck it up and deal with it and downplay any of the negatives. And so when he asked me how bad it hurt, I said, it's like, Oh, like a six or a seven, which was a lie. It was more than that. But again, very Midwestern. Um, 
And so he told me to take a pain reliever, basically like Tylenol. They don't call it Tylenol over here, but, and to call 111. Took a pain reliever, immediately barfed it up, <laughs> uh, called 111 and answered their question or answered a few questions. And they put me on a queue to call me back. By this time, it's like two in the morning. Um, haven't slept because I'm in so much pain. I lay down. I try to get some sleep. I think I was maybe just starting to drift off when 111 called me back at 430. And I answer some more questions. And this time I'm more honest. I'm like, the pain is like an eight. <laughs> She's like, okay, well then we'll put you in, we'll get you an appointment into A&E, which is um, accidents and emergency. So like their emergency room. And she's like, there's an appointment at 830. She did say I could go right then, but it's 430 in the morning. I'd been awake all night. I was gross. I'd been barfing. Um, I'd stopped bothering to brush my teeth because it was like, I'm just going to barf again. And, you know, I felt like I need a shower. I need to brush my teeth. I need to put clothes on. I'm like, let's, I've made it this far. We'll just take the 830 appointment. So I go, I get a taxi. I go there at 830. And this is where I will say it is true. Like there is, there is waiting involved when you're dealing with the NHS. Um, but to be fair, I think that if you're talking about emergency room situations in the U S there's waiting there as well, because it's triage, right? Like the person who has like a spike through their head is probably going to get seen before someone with like stomach pains. Right. Um, anyway, I get checked in and there's between each of these people seeing me, I go back to the waiting room to wait. So get checked in. And then a nurse calls me back and he has me pee in a little cup so he can run some tests. And then a doctor calls me back and she asks me a bunch of questions and she has me lay down and presses on different parts of my stomach to see like where the pain is located. And then she, and then a nurse calls me back to get me hooked up to an IV that gives me anti-nausea medication and anti-pain medication. It was so great because <laughs> it was like in me almost immediate effect of like taking the pain away. Um, because I had spent like obviously all night awake in pain. And then all of my energy in the emergency room was do not cry because I'm a Midwesterner and you do, you do not cry in public. Um, and then, uh, and then taking my blood for blood tests and then I'm waiting for the results. And then I get called back and she goes over the results. And thankfully it's, there's nothing like alarming in the test. So she diagnoses me with gastritis, um, and gives me some prescriptions for like, uh, basically like antacids and yeah, anti-nausea medication. And there's a pharmacy right there in the hospital. So I don't even have to go to a second location to pick up my drugs. So yes, there are wait times. Um, and you know, the fact that like I'm calling one, 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 and then they put me in a queue and they have to call me back. Right. That was like, okay. But it wasn't an emergency in the sense that like, obviously it was fine. It was a lot of pain, but I wasn't having a heart attack. I wasn't, you know, bleeding to death or anything like that. Um, but I would say that knowing that if I went to the emergency room, I would not have to pay any money. I would not be surprised by any added bills. Like it was already taken care of because I had paid into the NHS that made it a lot easier for me to make that phone call. If that had happened in the States, I don't think I would have called that soon. I probably would have toughed, tried to tough it out all night. I don't know how long I would have like just kept trying to grin and bear it knowing like, ugh, if I go to the emergency room, it's going to be a huge medical bill. Right. Um, so in that regard, I think it's way better over here in that people are incentivized to actually take care of their health, to, 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 
um, take advantage of preventative care and then to actually seek care when they need it instead of trying to like put it off or trying to tough it out or like, you know, suck it up or whatever. Um, and you, you know, the medication, it doesn't matter what medication it is. It's the same cost. It's nine pounds, 90 pence, which is $12 and 82 cents. Doesn't matter what the medicine is. So that's a, that's a reasonable, like price that's, that's manageable. Um, so to give you some idea of the costs, right? The yearly fee for NHS, if you're here like on a visa, and so you're paying that fee is 1,035 pounds. And that works out to $1,340. Compare that to what my insurance would have cost me per year in the district where I was teaching, it was $1,328. So it's like what, $12 cheaper in the US? For my plan at the school that had like group insurance, right? Which is actually pretty good insurance. And keeping in mind that that's just the premiums though, right? In the US, I would have had the added cost of copays. So if I went to a GP, it would be $20. If they were, um, you know, part of that plan, $40 if they were outside of it. Every prescription would have had a copay, um, about the same cost or more as what the cost is in the UK. That trip to the emergency room under um, my would have been previous insurance plan would have cost me $250, but it cost me nothing in the UK. Um, if I had had to have an ambulance ride there, that's an additional cost, right? There are a lot of additional costs that add up. It's not just your premiums. Whereas in the UK, it's like, it's just your, just what your premium is. And if you are, um, not part of group insurance, you have to buy it on your own, right? That's you're dealing with different numbers and insurance can just vary wildly in the US. I looked up what's the average cost of an individual insurance plan under group insurance and then under like the Affordable Care Act if you're getting like the the cheap kind of insurance for people who don't have it provided by their employer. So the average individual group plan in the US is $8,435 per year. That is a lot. That is a lot. And that's just the average, right? There are people who are paying more than that. And then if you're getting the bronze plan through the ACA as an individual who is 40 years old, you're paying about $5,000 a year. So both of those exponentially more than what you're paying in the UK. And even the, the, you know, what I would consider a pretty good insurance plan in the U S like provided by your employer. Um, it's about the same cost as what you're paying in the UK in premium oh, in your like premiums only, but then you have the additional costs of the co-pays and the, you know, your fee for if it's a trip to the emergency room, or if you have to have um, sort of specialized equipment or whatever, there's extra costs. So it does end up being more, no matter what, really. Um, so while the NHS has its problems, there are long wait times for procedures that are not, you know, like um, treating like life-threatening things, right? If it's a, it's something that can wait, you will have to wait. Um, and there are like staff shortages in a lot of hospitals. But when you're talking about an emergency, like if you're going to have an emergency, a medical emergency, I would much rather have a medical emergency in the UK than in the US. Um, because it's the emergencies that really get you in terms of like cost, um, you know, and, and long time, long term care. Right. And, you know, there's so much in the U S of people who have to do like a Kickstarter 
to help fund their medical costs or people who have to make tough choices about whether they're going to buy medication or whether they're going to buy groceries. And that shouldn't be happening in a country that is like the wealthiest nation in the world. It's actually immoral. The, the, the system that we have in place, the fact that there are people who are not being cared for, um, when they easily could be. So yes, you will hear people say that there are problems with universal health care programs. Of course there are, because, you know, we live in a fallen world and nothing is perfect. But I would take, you know, the problems with the NHS over the problems with the American health care system any day, hands down. Um, uh, it is an election year, and I would encourage you to think about that as one of many issues that I think you should think about. I think it's really dangerous if you're just a one issue voter. Um, but think about the kind of country you want to have in terms of how people are treated and, you know, just basic human rights of having access to affordable health care, um, of being able to make sure that your child can see a doctor when they need it and can get the life-saving medication that they need, that everybody is able to afford EpiPens for their, for their kids and, um, insulin and, you know, things that really are a life or death matter. Um, I, I can't believe that we're still having this conversation, that this is not something that has been taken care of already when it has been demonstrated, not just in the UK with the NHS, but in Canada and in basically, you know, most parts of Europe, certainly the Scandinavian countries and, you know, countries that we would point to as being, you know, leading countries in the world. Um, if they can do it, why can't we? But I'll just leave you on that and say that absolutely the NHS is one of the great things about being here. And it really is a load off of my mind knowing that if I have some sort of medical emergency, if I get hit by a car or whatever, that I won't have the added stress of, you know, how am I going to pay for this? So like, subscribe, tell your friends how gnarly this channel is, and I'll see you next time.